China, a country in East Asia with 23 provinces, five autonomous regions, four municipalities directly under the control of the central government, and two special administrative regions, the largest country in terms of population and the third largest in terms of territory size. Most of the country is in fact divided in provinces, here in pink. Macau and Hong Kong are special administrative regions, Beijing, Tanjing, Shanghai, and Chongqing are municipalities in light green, Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, Ningxiaoui, and Guangxi Zhuang, I'm sorry for mispronouncing these, are autonomous regions. This causes difference in the local power and autonomy that each of them has, and the laws they have to follow, but they are ultimately all controlled by the central government. But in which other ways do the territories differ from each other? When I say China is big, China is really big. It spans five geographical time zones, even though they only use one out of governmental decree and it borders 14 countries, the second most of any country in the world after Russia. Now in order to better understand this territory, its people and the country, I think a good solution is by looking at maps. I recently did a video about US maps that you seem to really like so I thought this could be interesting to do for other countries using data maps or just maps in general that allow us to learn about them. So in this video, China, the People's Republic of China. Starting with the ones on the thumbnail. First, religion. The map on the thumbnail is a little simplified, but it illustrates an important point. China has various religions within it, and they vary a lot depending on the territory. Chinese folk religion represents about 73% of the people, Buddhism is next with 15%, then Taoism at 7, Protestantism at 2, Islam at 0.5, and Catholicism at 0.3. Despite having very low values overall, these are sometimes more prevalent in specific regions and represent majorities in some of them. In this map, we can see it. The very various areas in which each religion is the biggest. Overall, folk religion is the most followed, but in the Northwest, there is, or at least was, a great prevalence of Islam. In Tibet, a great prevalence of Buddhism, and then in some small locations throughout the country, places where Catholicism, Protestantism, Taoism and even Orthodoxism are followed in significant number. Near the Mongolian border, some Mongolian folk religions are also followed. This sequence of maps allows us to go religion by religion and see how many people in each province follow each of them. Buddhism is mostly followed in Tibet and in this coastal region. Belief in Chinese ancestor gods is present mostly in the east and south. Christianity is somewhat present in the east and northeast, but especially in these two central provinces, reaching 5% of believers in those areas. Folk religion is mostly present in Manchuria as well as the northern part of the east coast. Islam is concentrated in the northwest and while it only represents 0.5 of the Chinese population, it can represent up to 60% in these northwestern provinces, demonstrating the cultural differences that exist within the country depending on the province. Taoism has very low influence throughout most of the country, but it grows to medium in the highly populated areas and into high in the south. In conclusion, the the fact that so many religions are followed and the fact that their prevalence varies depending on the region allows us to understand that China is a very culturally diverse country, at least in its origin. Religion in China is so complex and has such a fascinating history that I can make a whole video about this if you're interested, from European religious missions to its current relationship with the Vatican to their heavenly kingdom of peace rebellion. Next, population. Like I said at the beginning, China has a lot of people. Although their population control policies have actually now led them to a future population crisis, with some news reports pointing to the fact their population could be cut in half in the next 45 years. But today, there's still a lot, and their distribution along their territory is interesting. This map is very well known, and maybe you've seen it before. It's the Heye Tengchong Line, an imaginary line that divides the area of China into two roughly equal parts with contrasting population densities. In the east, on the coastal region, live 94% of the Chinese population, and in the west, in a territory roughly the same size, only 6%. The reasons why are fairly simple. Coastal cities have more economic development and therefore more job opportunities, which leads to a better quality of life. And then, the environment and ecosystems in the west are also less habitable. Mountains and deserts contrast with the plains of the east and the coast. Before we move on with the video, a quick message from today's sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist is a long-term friend of the channel 
piano and honestly a product that I actually love and use. They didn't even give me a free account. I actually created and paid for one because I like their service so much. I like reading, but a lot of times I just don't have time to do it. And with Blinkist, I can. Blinkist takes thousands of nonfiction books and condenses their key points into 15 minute listening or reading sessions. Right now, and in line with the topic of this video, I'm reading this really cool book called China's Second Continent, which covers the mass wave of Chinese migration and Chinese investment in Africa and its economy. The first 100 people to go to Blinkist.com slash general knowledge will get free unlimited access for one week and then also a 25% discount if you choose to continue with the full membership. Thanks to them for sponsoring this video and now back to the maps. Moving precisely to the point of geography, in the satellite picture of the country we can tell the differences between east and west, with a great deal of the west being desert and mountainous regions which are not as suitable for habitability and economic development, while the east and coast are more green plains which allow this. The east also contains all the main rivers which facilitates settling and growth due to the access to fresh drinking water and allows for more effective agriculture. This data is from the 1960s, severely outdated, but it demonstrates how most of the farming was concentrated in the east and this might still be the case today. In this other map, we can see the traditional physical and cultural divisions of current China, and in it we can tell apart the more inhabited area here depicted as China proper. The Tibetan Plateau and inland frontiers are the least, with Manchuria and Yunggi following. And these cultural divisions are not only evident through religion or physical separation, but also through language. This map is also reasonably outdated from 1983, but I assume the general trend may have maintained itself. After all, I would say many of the people alive in 1983 will be alive today and I doubt much has changed in one or two generations, but correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. This is an ethno-linguistic map. China proper is mostly of the Han ethnicity, Yunggi of the Ta, and the Tibetan plateau represents the Tibeto-Burman people, while in the north and west are those of Mongolian and Turkish heritage, with also smaller groups of Miaoyao, Tajik, Korean, or Mon Khmer in some smaller regions throughout the country. This reminds us of the five peoples under one union concept, one of the major principles upon which the Republic of China was founded in 1911, using a five-striped colored flag to represent each of these peoples. They were, and in part still are, the major ethnic groups of the country, the Han, the Manchus, the Mongols, the Ui, and the Tibetans, showing us how these differences go way back in time and are embedded in the people and the territory. In this other map from 1990, which focuses on languages themselves, we can see that Mandarin is the most present language countrywide. Southern Mandarin follows being spoken in the south and extending into the country of Taiwan, but we have to remember that within Mandarin there are a few variations as well. Tibetan in Tibet and Mongolian in the northern border regions, with other small idioms like Kamtai, Tajik or Korean also being present. Earlier I talked about how the fact the main rivers are in the east provides an advantage for local agriculture. And speaking of food, here is a map that shows us the different types of food existent in China. If you live in Europe or in America, you probably think of Chinese food as a single thing. But Chinese food actually varies a lot, and some countries have one type of it as opposed to others, depending on which provinces their migrant communities come from. From the coast is where the most variety exists, but there's also completely different cuisines including Muslim, Mongolian, Northern or Tibetan, more evidence of the diverse cultures that China holds within its borders. The concentration of economic activity in the coast and eastern territory is also evident in this map displaying the amount of Fortune 500 companies located in each province. These are where the biggest companies in China have their headquarters, and as we can see the vast, vast majority are located in these three coastal provinces, with only a small number in the southwest, northeast, and only two in the northwest. If these large companies are any example of how the main part of the Chinese economy is concentrated in these areas, and I think it is, we can easily understand why most people live there. It's where the jobs are. Speaking of the economy and money, here is how Chinese regions GDPs compare to different countries around the world. This really makes us understand how powerful the Chinese economy is, and how each of the provinces compares to each other, with their total GDP surpassing that of 26 six other countries combined. And these aren't even small countries. We have Chinese provinces that alone equal the GDP of Korea, Canada, Russia, 
Australia, Turkey, Spain, Israel, Argentina, the Netherlands, or Malaysia. The lowest are able to equal Sri Lanka, Kenya, and Zambia. When it comes to the GDP per capita in each province, Shanghai, Beijing, and the autonomous area of Hong Kong have the highest, being above 20,000 a year. Next are those in light green, almost all on the east coast provinces, with the addition of Ubei and Chongqing, and the poorest province, according to this, is Gansu in the interior. But this is just a mathematical division of of total GDP by the number of people that live there, it doesn't translate to effective income by each of them and does not directly translate into quality of life. Something that does, however, translate into quality of life is air quality. In this map, we can see the air quality in China, an issue that threatens Chinese residents a lot due to the intense industrialization of some areas of the country and the negative consequences that has in air pollution. And it becomes evident that air quality in China is not usually good, with the biggest concentration of hazy weather being in the east. And in this interactive live map, where the lower the number, the higher the air quality, we can compare China with Japan, for instance, and you can tell the amount of orange and red that China has compared to Japan's mostly green or yellow. Ever since the 20th century, this map is from 1967, that the main industrial areas have been concentrated in the east as well, so it's logical that these are the areas with the worst air quality. And finally, speaking of air, a map that divides China into its different climate zones. Because it's not only the people and cultures that vary depending on the province, but also the physical and weather characteristics of them. As some regions are desert, others mountainous, and others plains, this is reflected reflected in the type of climate that they have as well. The east is mostly dry winter subtropical, the northeast is warm summer continental, Tibet is a tundra, while the northwest is a cold desert. So, those are a few interesting maps that teach us about China, allowing us to better understand how it exists and functions as a country, how its territory is organized, how its people are distributed, how they are categorized, and how they live. And most importantly, how these territories differ from each other depending on their area, the people who live there, the language they speak, the religion they follow, or the food that they eat, which all translate into the different cultures that exist within the country of China. Thanks so much for watching this video, subscribe if you want, and leave your opinion in the comments. Did you find this data surprising? Is it accurate according to what you know? And which other interesting divisions and differences exist within the Chinese people and its provinces? I will see you next time for more general knowledge.